Hello, everybody. My name is Phil Chan, and I'm the co-founder of Final Bow for Yellowface. Welcome to What's the Tea, a daily conversation with a dancer of Asian descent during the month of May for Asian Pacific Heritage Month to highlight the achievements and experiences of Asians in dance. I'm very excited today because I'm chatting with someone who's actually in my book. Uh, we have dancer Brett Fakuda from Opera Nationale du Rhin. In, um, where, where are you? You're in France. Yes, um, I'm in Mulhouse, but our main theater is in Strasbourg, which is about um, an hour train ride away from here. Okay, so and and um, you you have an experience dancing with a lot of different companies, both in the United States and in Europe. So I'm very excited to chat with you and hear more about your story. Um, but first of all, uh, how are you doing? Like, what's what's going on with you? How are you hanging in there with the quarantine? Um, and what are you missing right now? Yeah, um, so first of all, um, I'm going to say anyone, I would recommend your book to anyone, um, regardless of whether or not the person is Asian. I think you bring up some really important points around how to have um, civil discussions around race in the ballet world. Um, and I also want to say thank you to both you and Georgina for you know raising awareness as well as the change you've brought on in terms of um, you know choreo choreography in the Nutcracker, um, costume changes, makeup changes, and also for um, providing this platform on Instagram for dancers to speak openly about um, their own racial complexities that they've experienced. And yeah, I think it's it's not only rare to hear um, dancers speak honestly about it, but it's just really important to um, share stories um, so that we can relate to one another and um, raise awareness and bring change. Um, well, thank you for that. I, I think it's so, yeah. um, I, I think there's a power dynamic that happens where dancers don't feel like they can speak up because it might affect casting or promotions or, um, you know, there's just a, an uncomfortable Absolutely. power dynamic. So, uh, but in this space that we've created, sort of everybody is all sharing together. So it's almost like no one person can be, um, be spoken up for, you know, it's like, well, we're all having this experience, you know, listen to all of us together. So I think there's power in numbers. Yeah. So it's really been empowering for us to, to hear all these different stories. So, um, so what are you missing right now? What's going on? So actually, um, we've begun classes in the studio here. So that just started last week. Um, we had wow. two kind of um, trial classes and now this week we've begun everyday class. And France has begun what it's called, it's deconfinement. Um, so, you know, I think right now I feel cautiously optimistic. Um, you know, I don't think, I think it's too early to like celebrate and say that, you know, the virus is gone, like obviously it's not, but um, you know, the company has begun classes so that's definitely progress and it it's helped the um, overall mood of everyone definitely and it's so nice to have like live music again and some space to move and um i'm still kind of getting used to it because there's quite a few um steps that we have to respect in order to work safely um so i'm kind of still getting used to like you know, we have so many um, protocols that we have to follow, like from the minute we arrive at the ballet. So I'm kind of like, like I feel like every day I kind of forget one, but I'm, I'm kind of beginning to get used to that um, schedule. What's that routine that. look like? I, I, we're all very curious, you know, because we're still on the other side of it. So what does that routine look like? What is coming, coming back to normal look like? I can see Gina fidgeting over there. She's, she's dying to know, yeah. she's dying to get back in there. I know, like I'm really, I'm happy to share because um, I feel it's weird because actually we're the only company in, company in France that's working. And from what I understand, we're kind of like the guinea pigs. Um, like all the other companies are kind of waiting to see what happens with us um, before they start and what, what works and what doesn't. So we arrive at the studio and you have to be wearing your ballet clothes already. And it kind of feels like, you know, like a summer program or something in that sense. Um, and as soon as you get through the door, someone takes your temperature, then 
when you get through the second door, you have to remove your shoes and then you remove your um, like How your very jacket. Asian. Yeah, honestly, like I'm like, oh, I feel like I'm in Japan again. Like it feels, <laughs> I feel like oh, my shoes off. You know, it's nice. Um, and then, I mean, this is kind of a funny part for me is that you have to put all your ballet stuff into a, a trash bag. Um, and then you carry that trash bag to the studio and you also get your own personal, um, disinfectant spray as well as a towel to wipe. And they've been, um, really good about changing all of our trash cans to, um, you know, pedal, pedal operating trash cans. Um, so then, oh, and, oh, obvi I kind of like forgot the most important thing. Obviously you arrive with your mask. Like they've given us masks that are washable that we reuse. And um, you have to wipe down your bar spot. You have to be mindful that, you know, anytime you take a sip of water, they have um, bottles of Purell all over the studio. So before you take off your mask to take a sip of water, you have to be sure to um, desanitize your hands. Um, and like for me right now, the biggest challenge is that um, it's really hard to breathe with the mask on. So that's definitely. So you're um, doing full class, full class in a mask. Yes, I mean right now class is only an hour, and I think we're working to make it a little bit longer because the the problem. I think the company was trying to be kind in that you know they wanted to start back easy because they recognize that we've had a lot of time off. Um, but the problem is that because we can't breathe very well, we have to take longer pauses in between each combination which kind of delays the whole class. So normally we don't even get that far in the center. Like we kind of only get to pirouettes or just the first jumping combination and then kind of class ends. Um, so, I mean, the, the good news is I'll say that like, I feel, um, I feel less out of shape than I thought I would be. You know, I think because I've been injured before, I, I thought it would be similar to that. Like you take a lot of time off from an injury and then you come back, but it is different because you're not working um, with a specific weakness and you're not working with like, you know, a new kneecap or something like your body is still healthy and you do still have strength. You know, you, you still can get stronger depending what you do in your apartment. So I think that was one um Thing that I realized that I was like pleasantly surprised. I was like, oh, you know, this isn't as hard as it was when I was injured. It's, you know, I, I, I still feel strong. It's just some things are weird. It's hard to breathe with the mask. Um, but yeah, it's working for the most part. So we'll see how it goes. Um, I think my director has some plans to start working on like some solos or something like that. But <laughs> otherwise, you know, it's a, you night, of really a, do a night of a thousand solos. Yeah, exactly. You know, like a one a one man ballet. So yeah, that's With, pretty much for for one for one audience member, one solo yeah. for one audience member. Yeah, a private Great. performance. Yeah, it's really think, like that. I would think be we're cool. we're gonna get we're gonna explore a lot of these ideas that the postmodern dance world has been doing for years already, and I think ballet is like finally gonna catch up because of this. So um, exciting, creative times ahead, yeah. and and uh, congratulations for getting back into the studio and. Um, we are all insanely jealous. So um, oh, no. thank you for <laughs> no, thank you for sharing that with us. Um, yeah, I want so to let's, 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 so it, but it's good. It gives us hope that like, okay, at least we'll be able to move and sweat around together uh, in the near future. So um, thank yeah, you for exactly. that for the little glimmer of hope. Um, so yeah. would love to hear more about your personal story. Um, you know, when did you when did you start your dance training? Where are you from? Um, what's your story? How did you get? How did you discover dance? So um, I started dancing at a jazz studio. Um, it was called In the Spotlight, and um, in order to be on like the jazz team, you had to take a weekly ballet class, and. Um, unfortunately, like no one took the ballet class very seriously. Like it was just kind of like, oh, we have to do this in order to take jazz. But, um, you know, I don't know if it's, it was intentional, but my mom at one point ended up renting a 
VCR tape of Othello starring um, Yuan Yuan Tan and also Desmond Richardson, which is an incredibly diverse and beautiful cast. Um, and I have a really distinct memory of watching that in my living room and just being um, completely mesmerized by her and how like ethereal she's, she seemed. And kind of after that moment, I was like, you know, I decided to take ballet a little bit more seriously. And I think my teacher was grateful to have someone who was taking it seriously. So she really took me under her wing and um, it eventually led me to audition for SAB and kind of that like accelerated path begun for the most part. And, and, and do you think um, the fact that Yuan Yuan Tan is Asian, did that make a difference to you or, or just because of the quality of her dancing? I think it must have made a difference for me. Like, I don't think I realized it at the time, but now as an adult looking back, maybe I would, I would have never become a dancer if it was a video of, you know, some like white Russian ballerina. Maybe I wouldn't have been able to have the same, I wouldn't, I wouldn't have been able to picture myself in the same role and have the same dream if it was someone who I couldn't relate to. You know, it's something that I think about now, but at the time I, I don't know, I, it, I was too young to like make that connection. And I don't, I, like I've never asked my mom if she was intentional, intentional about buying um, this video with an Asian principal, like I never asked her about it, um, so I should. <laughs> um, and so then at what point, so you, you're at SAB, at what point uh, did you say like, hey, I, I think I wanna do this as like a career, like this is more than just like, you know, a, a good place to go after school or whatever? Yeah, um, actually, I mean, it's kind of started before then when my teacher from this jazz studio, like, she actually sat me down and had a conversation saying, like, um, you know, do you want to have this as a hobby or a career? Because if you want it to be a career, then from this moment on, from this moment forward, like, I'm going to be a lot more intense with you. But if you want to just have it as a hobby, then we can, you know, take it easy. And I mean, I was pretty, I was a little intimidated by her, um, but I am grateful that she sat me down and had that conversation because she was very honest. Um, and of course I was naive, like I didn't really, like I, I said I wanted to have it as a career, but I didn't really know what that meant. Um, I didn't even realize that was a possibility. Like both my parents were so naive. Like when we auditioned for SAB, I had no idea what New York City Ballet was and you know we had I lived in New Jersey and it was the first time we had ever uh, drove to New York and you know I remember getting like really car sick and like we left like four hours early and like you know the whole thing was just really surreal um I didn't expect to get in like it all just happened really quickly and my parents um were just excited like they had no idea what to expect um, tell me more about your your parents um, and you know what, what what's your cultural heritage and and to what degree um, were they were they aware of ballet and how did they they you know kind of fall into becoming parents of a ballet dancer? Yeah, so um, my father is Japanese um, and my mother is American but from um, German and Irish descent. Um, I, I mean, it's really funny because um, there's quite a few members of my family um, in the Japanese side who are really artistic, but all of them as professions are like businessmen and doctors. And, you know, I don't know if it's because maybe they weren't given um, the space and the opportunity to pursue their art as their profession or, you know, I, I never, I don't really know why. So I, I do feel like there is this part of my dad's side that is, you know, extremely proud of me to have, to be an artist as my profession. I think that, like maybe um, they missed that opportunity and they're happy that I was able to um, work on that. And then in terms of my mom, um, I guess it's a little bit different. She 
she was, ex I mean, both my parents were extremely supportive, but um, with my mom, I do feel like there was a certain point in my career where, um, you know, because the field is so competitive and there's a lot of um, rejection and heartbreak and it's really intense on the body. There's a lot of pain and injury. Like, I think there was a certain point where my mom felt a little, a little bit guilty almost for, you know, letting me do this without knowing how intense it was going to be. So I think that was a little bit challenging for her at a certain moment. But they've both been really supportive, and I think um, they're really happy with my career choice now. That's great. Very good to hear. And and yeah. to what degree yeah. are you connected to your your ethnic and cultural heritage? Um, so I was born in Japan and I left when I was two. Um, we lived in England for two years and then I moved to New Jersey. Um, but the thing is that when my family moved to America, my father moved back to Japan. So I was raised completely by my mother who's white. Um, so you know, I didn't, I didn't go back to Japan again until I was 17. So I missed like 15 years of um, connecting to the culture. So that, that really like affected my childhood in a way. Um, you know, as an adult, I feel extremely proud of my Japanese heritage. And, you know, I can like very easily tell one of my friends who's like thinking of a place to travel, like it's very easy for me to say like, go to Japan, it, it will change your life, you know? Um, but when I was younger, I, I didn't connect with it so much. And I, I think sometimes I felt embarrassed of it in a way, which, you know, I'm not happy to say that, um, like literal, little, um, little cultural things like, you know, in Japan, like it's, um, it's, it's polite and respectful. If you like slurp your soup really loud, like it means that you're like enjoying the meal and that, you know, it's like compliments to the chef in a way. And I remember like when my dad would visit and he would um, kind of like slurp his soup really loud, I would be really embarrassed of that, you know, like things like that I, I remember as a kid, like it was very different. I didn't connect as much to my heritage. Um, and to what degree do you think you are now um, using that to inform your experience as a dancer? Or is, does your heritage connect to your artistry in any way? Yeah, I think it does. I mean, I've been thinking about this question a bit. Um, I feel like, I mean, well, first of all, I would be remiss if I didn't mention that um, my Japanese name is Mai, and in Japanese it means to dance. So my family in Japan is like very proud of, you know, proud of that. And they like to take credit for that. Um, but I think in the same way that now, you know, I'm, I'm not a religious person at all, but I do think that now when I visit Japan, I do feel like it is easier for me to kind of access this more spiritual side of myself. And, um, I feel like the same thing happens to me when I dance in a way that like when I'm dancing, I can feel that I can connect to something outside of myself, something bigger than myself in the same way that when I visit Japan and I visit a temple, I feel connected to something bigger than myself and something outside of myself. Yeah, I think ballet is also a culture and a heritage that we belong to. And I think that's a lot of the <clears throat> where, where Jean and I are coming from when we're talking about Asian representation is, um, yes, we are Asians, but we're also dancers. So when we talk about our heritage and our legacy, we're also talking about Balanchine. We're also talking about Petty Pa. So it's not just saying, yeah. um, well, it's it's Chinese, Filipino, Japanese, Korean. It's it's This is also a heritage. So um, it's nice to be able to see both of those parallels, both in your heritage and in your professional and passion. So great, great to thank you for sharing that with us. Um, so yeah. now I, I was reading about you and you you have kind of danced with a few different American companies and now you're in Europe. Um, so you've definitely gotten to see how different environments, you know, produce dance and um, 
you know, how we deal with things. So I'd love to hear what are some of the differences, um, especially when it comes to how we represent race and your experience. Um, how are we doing as a ballet community? Yeah, so, I mean, I noticed in like the, some of the earlier interviews, you kind of asked the dancers to provide like a letter grade. Um, and to be honest with you, I kind of think that most of them were like too kind, like. Oh, okay, so what's your letter grade? <laughs> yeah, yeah um, here, so, let's hear your story. Okay, What's so, the tea? Yeah, I think I'll like spill the tea or whatever. Um, here we go. Yeah, so personally, I don't think that ballet is evolving fast enough. I definitely don't think it is for 2020 and compared to other um, jobs, you know. Um, so I would probably give ballet like a D, I think. Um, okay. So so uh, a final bow for Yellow Face is all about education and offering people constructive uh, solutions for how to do better. So what are some things that we as a community need to do better when it comes to race and representation? How are, how, are, how can we get that D up to maybe a C plus or a B minus by the end of the semester? Um, I mean, I think most change starts at the top. So of course, having more directors of color, more choreographers of color, more ballet masters of color would really help. Um, I also think that dancers need to take more responsibility about speaking speaking up um, in the studio. If, if there is like a microaggression or um, something inappropriate is said, I think that, you know, if the, if, I think that silence is really dangerous. And I think, um, you know, I've, I've seen it happen before where the ballet master sitting in the front of the studio doesn't say anything. And if that's the case, then I think that we as dancers need to take an oath to speak up. Because as you said earlier, like when one dancer does it, um, it makes the rest of us feel empowered and responsible to do the same. Um, can you give me and an then, example of like what 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 sort of what would come up in the studio? Um, because I think a lot of the dancers that we've talked to might not have experienced that, or they might have experienced it but didn't register that in the same way. So can you give us some examples of what a dancer might encounter in the studio that might be problematic that we should speak up against? Maybe something you've seen in your in your career uh, that has bothered you if you've if you're comfortable sharing. Um, I mean, I've seen things, I've experienced things not only in terms of race, but also in terms of gender. Um, so I remember there was one stager who, um, we were doing a piece that was all women and it actually took place in France and we were supposed to be like really flirty. And, um, he said to us that, you know, like we weren't, we weren't giving enough and he kind of made a comment that we were all acting like timid virgins and you know that's just it's just really inappropriate to say that to a group of grown women you know and it's offensive and there's already kind of a weird stigma around ballet and this kind of like virginal aspect of it um and i remember there was one a uh, court of ballet woman at the time who was pregnant when when he said when the when the stager said that so we were all just like seriously and i think for me the most disappointing thing was that the ballet master sitting in the front didn't say anything like to me that was really hurtful because it just felt like you know they should have our back but they didn't um yeah so and like I was, I was younger at the time. I was kind of new to the company, and there wasn't was a dancer who um, went to the director to um, kind of demand an apology on behalf of all the female dancers, and kind of um, I believe an excuse was made that oh well you know like the stager he's European and it's different and that's not what he means and it was a little bit brush off. So I think like if we had all taken a stand in that moment, maybe um, we, we would have gotten the apology we deserved. Yeah. 
Can you tell me more specifically about race, though? I mean, a D, a D is a pretty low grade. So besides, yeah. um, you know, you mentioned getting more um, sort of more creative staff behind the scenes to be uh, people of color. What are some other things that the dance world can do to, to maybe, you know, get that grade up? Yeah, um, I think perhaps we should improve our HR department so that dancers do feel more comfortable to complain if they need to. Um, because I feel like in previous companies that I worked worked for, I wasn't even aware of who the HR person was. You know, it wasn't really something that was talked about. So I think we do need to, yeah, I think we do need to, you know, make dancers really aware that they do have this um, right to to speak up or like, even if it's like demanding um, a recording of your, your meeting with your director, or like, you know, you have to like, you have to know your rights in order to um, feel empowered to use them. And I feel like sometimes like your rights as a dancer are a little bit like hidden, like they kind of want to hide the fact that there is an HR department that is supposed to be there to help you. So I think we could improve um, in that department a lot. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's tough. Um, yeah, it is, it's tough to, you know, the best way to. Yeah. Now, do you change. personally have any ex experience with yellow face um, that you'd like to share or um, anything about your heritage in the, in the ballet studio that has been um, maybe uncomfortable for you? Yeah. Um, I mean, I think most of the things I've experienced are microaggressions. Um, but I do feel like sometimes these things happen so frequently that sometimes dancers become desensitized to them, which is really dangerous as well. But I did have something happen kind of recently um, where, um, so there's another American dancer who recently joined Ballet Defend, and he is also half Japanese. And someone kind of made the comment that we look like brother and sister. And I knew that they were making that comment because we were both Asian. And I do, I do, I do think I need to work on, um, like I get really fired up about things and I feel like I don't, I can't, I, I'm not open to like having a discussion about it because I just feel like sometimes I think like, oh, I don't want to deal with someone who thinks that way, but that's not, that's not helpful. And I, as you said in your book, like it's not productive to be that way. But at the time, um, I sort of became passive aggressive. And so I was like, oh, you know, why? why would you say something like that? Like, why, why do you think we look like brother and sister? And the person, um, you know, I feel embarrassed to even do this, but the person said, oh, you know, it's because you're both like this. And they did like this motion with their eyes. And, you know, I was, I was just speechless because I haven't seen someone do that since I was like a child, you know, like I just, I didn't even know what to say. Like, I was just so dumbfounded that that had just happened that I kind of, like, I, I was at a loss for words, you know? And I, I wish I had, I wish I had been able to explain to them, like, that you cannot do that anymore. You know, like, that's extremely offensive to, you know, make someone feel so small that they're defined by a simple characteristic of their face. Like, it's just really not okay, but... I was just speechless and I didn't say anything. I think I just got up and walked away, you know, like it was just, I was like just in such a state of shock. Yeah, I think it, it can be really hard when you face um, experiences like that to have a calm and like rational response because it, it, it brings up something that's almost irrational in you. So like, I think the, the probably the best thing to do sometimes is like, if you don't, if you can't say anything constructive back, that, that makes the situation better. And the only thing you can do sometimes is to walk away. Um, but it's hard, I know, yeah. you know, thank you for sharing that with us. And um, yeah, I think it, it, things like that do happen more when you are in the minority um, in, uh, you know, as, as a minority within a majority culture, um, the way a lot of Asians are in classical ballet. Um, you know, growing up in Hong Kong as a Chinese person, nobody pulled their eyes 
out at me because everybody was Chinese, <laughs> you know? So yeah. that wasn't like a thing until we moved to America. And then I was like, oh, why is this a thing? Like, you know, no one, no one had ever done that be to me before. So, um, yeah. yeah, I think it's, I think it's, yeah, I think people just have to, have to learn to do better. And, and we just have to get better at responding to those things in the moment. So, um, yeah, thank you for sharing that with, with us. Um, I guess uh, for, for young dancers right now who are um, kind of struggling to find their bearings, um, what advice would you have for them uh, in terms of how to get a career? And um, could you talk a little bit about the difference between a career in the United States versus a career in Europe? Yeah. Um, I think if you want a career in Europe, I would really recommend that you take some improv classes because that's one thing that I did not have growing up. And that was really difficult for me to feel comfortable with when I moved here, you know, like, I think there's a little bit of a misconception among ballet dancers that, oh, like once my, my feet are tired of wearing point shoes, I'll just join a contemporary company and, and be more comfortable. But it's just a different genre and it takes a lot of practice. And so many of my European colleagues have had, you know, so many courses in improv from a very young age. And they talk about like, even like a whole course on floor work. And sometimes I'm just like, why didn't I have that when I was growing up? Like, it's really just like not a thing in American schools, which is really a shame. Um, but aside from that, I would say that um, I think the most dangerous thing for a young person to have or a young uh, ballet student to have is kind of like this tunnel vision, which I also, you know, am guilty of, where you think like one school or one company is the only company and that's the best one and that's my dream. And if, if not that, then I quit. You know, I think that's a really dangerous mindset because um, in the ballet world, you'll experience a lot of rejection. And so I think it's important to educate yourself on um, what, what kind of style suits you best. And also to know what it feels like to be in a school or in a company that really cultivates your growth. You know, like I don't, I think, you know, sometimes even the best school that you can get into isn't the best school for that person. You know, like some people work in different ways and I think you just really need to be somewhere where you're appreciated and you feel like, um, yeah, that your instructor or your director helps you grow, you know, not threatens, not as threatening you, you know. I think that's very good advice. Um, although I've had my fair share of teachers who've given the tough love, you know, yeah. kind of situation too. So it's um, it, it's it definitely depends on your personality. But I think um, at the end of the day, all of my tough love teachers have always had a lot of respect, you know, for me, and and uh, it's it's also been a mutual respect. So um, so make sure that uh, you find a teacher not only that you respect as an educator, but that also respects you as a, as a young person. I think that's great advice. Um, as, as you are one of the first guinea pigs to emerge uh, post COVID, yeah. or at least to some degree of getting back to a normal routine, um, what do you think the larger dance community needs to do in order to build a loyal, younger, more inclusive audience? So it's not just old wealthy people, but it's like, you know, dance for everybody and dance that everyone wants to keep supporting, um, you know, not just a, a few people. Yeah. Um, I feel like the ballet world could benefit from becoming a little bit more casual. Like I would love to see ballet, like going to the ballet being held is the same kind of event, like going to the museum, like you can go on like a ballet date or like a museum date. Like I think a lot of people who aren't dancers are a little intimidated to see a ballet if they don't know anything about it. Like that, that was one thing that I learned like from my non-dancer friends where that they were constantly kind of saying things like, oh, well, I, I don't know anything about ballet. Like how could I, how could I enjoy it if I don't have that kind of knowledge? And you know, that's a, we need to work on um, 
like opening it up so that people can understand like you don't need to know anything about ballet to enjoy it. Like maybe you'll even enjoy it more if you don't know anything about ballet, because then you can just watch someone do a variation and just enjoy it for what it is and not be like nitpicking about like, you know, their turnout or something stupid. That's as ridiculous as someone saying, you know, I don't know if I can enjoy donuts because I don't know what they are. <laughs> Everybody can enjoy donuts. Um, yeah, so, totally. so how can how can we how can we counter that mentality um, when we're trying to reach new people to say like, hey, you can come in your jeans, you can come in your sneakers, you can come as you are. You don't need to have read a book. You don't need to have taken a course in college. Um, you can literally just come and be and have an, a human experience. Um, whoever you are, however old you are, however much education, wherever in the world you come from, whatever your heritage or background, um, what are some things that we can do to get through people's minds, um, you know, as ballet people? Um, I mean, I definitely think it's always helpful if you kind of know a little bit about the dancer who's performing on like a personal level. So I think like, if audience members can see dancers more as humans, you know, like not just dancers, like we're human beings with like somewhat normal lives. And I think that would help the younger audience feel more engaged to be able to relate to the person who's on stage or, you know, I don't, I don't know if Valley would ever like reach the celebrity status that it has in like Cuba or, or some other countries, but um, I think it would be helpful to, like maybe for the PR department to continue to show the dancers as not only dancers, but also human beings. I mean, that's one thing within um, a confinement that has kind of frustrated me is like this idea that like dancers in their home, like can't survive without ballet. And they, you know, like there's all these like kind of silly videos of like dancers, like doing dishes in their point shoes and whatever. And I don't know if that's really helpful to our career. Like we are, normal human beings at the end of the day you know i don't think there's anything wrong with that and i think it could help help audience members feel more connected to us if, if they know that well if you wanted to know a dancer who's a real human being um i think gina and i think was it angelica and one of the other ballerinas are going to do like a dumpling cook-off because they've been both been oh cooking dumplings on this so they're literally going to like ballerinas eating dumplings is like the next show like netflix give us a call that's like the next show it's like ballerinas eating dumplings yeah um, you call like um <laughs> You know David Chang because he has some really good Netflix shows like about Asian 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 culinary scene. Like maybe he would get on board or something. <laughs> I'm well. I'm glad I'm I'm doing this interview because if you were talking to Gina, she would have hijacked this into like a food direction. So, um, <laughs> well, is uh, so so uh, again before we we leave. Um, you know, we're also using these uh, daily chats to raise money or raise awareness for causes that uh, our dancers are passionate about. So um, what what would you like to raise money for or make an appeal to our audience for today? Yeah, um, I mean, definitely for non well dancers and non dancers watching this, like, I feel like when the confinement ends, everyone's going to like run to the restaurants and to the bars and to the beach. But, you know, don't forget about the theaters, like try to support your local ballet company. You know, I think at the end of the day, like spend the hour, the hour and a half you spend watching a live performance um, will benefit you more than the hour and a half you spend, you know, watching Netflix or, or whatever, you know, it's like, medicine for your body and your soul um and also um support your local news source as well like i think um reliable news and information is in danger right now and you know if you read the new york times every morning like subscribe and support your local newspaper and also make sure to click on every single dance link you can see to get our papers to have more dance criticism and dance coverage. So also very important. Yeah, so if you read the times, make sure you read the dance section every day too. Um, well, thank you so much. Thank you so much for taking the time to chat with us today, Brett. Um, and thank you to everybody who's tuning in uh, and hearing these um, 
daily What's the Tea interviews. Make sure to check out our Instagram page right now for a reveal of who tomorrow's dancer will be and tune at noon Eastern time tomorrow for our next conversation. Thank you again, Brett. Thank you so much, Phil and Georgina. <laughs>